In our final look at week three, we discuss the latest injury news, share our confidence and concerns, and make final predictions all leading up to this weekend's action right now on the Locked On Commanders podcast. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome, in Commanders fans, to the Locked On Commanders podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube and the WUSA 9 Plus app on your Roku or Amazon Fire Stick. And we thank you for making us your first listen or view of the day. I'm David Harris. My co-host is Chris the Rooster. Russell, both of us, credentialed media covering your Commanders Chris for the Team 980, where you'll find him and Pete Medhurst live from 9 a.m. to noon Eastern, Monday through Friday, or anytime on the Odyssey app. And you can find me at Commander Country, where I'm a writer for Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation. Indeed you are, David, and good to be back with you uh, on this edition of the Locked On Commanders podcast. We thank you guys again for making us your first view or your first listen of the day. <clears throat> Today's episode of LOC is brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Of course, you know Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Our biggest confidence and our biggest concerns for the Commanders heading into a critical Week Three NFC East Division matchup against the Philadelphia Eagles are coming up later in this episode. But first, we need to dive into the most recent injury report, David was in Ashburn, Virginia on both Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so let me run down the injuries and then we'll get his observations and reactions. Casey Tuhill, concussion. Daniel Wise, both defensive linemen, one and end, one uh, kind of a hybrid uh, in Wise, high ankle sprain, both not practicing Thursday or Wednesday for that matter. James Smith-Williams was added as a limited participant on Thursday with an abdominal issue, uh, but told reporters afterwards that he's fine, uh, just a little overexertion. Sadiq Charles, uh, who could play an interesting role in this game, I would say, limited the last two days with a shoulder injury, uh, and everyone else was full go, including, and this is the really good news, Jonathan Allen, Wes Schweitzer, Trey Turner, Cole Holcomb, and Shaka Tony for the Eagles, Fletcher Cox, Avante Maddox, Lane Johnson, Hassan Reddick, Darius Slay, and a host of others were all limited on Thursday. Of course, they played on Monday night, and most were marked as a did not practice on Wednesday, even though uh, that was just an estimate, just a thing, uh, because yeah. the NFL makes uh, you do these wacky injury reports. So, David, I would say some good news. And some worrisome news still very much on the defensive line, right? Yeah, I mean, it, the defensive line is banked up. Like, that's just the that's that's the nicest way uh, you can put it. You know, Casey Tuhill, look, I don't, I don't Casey's not playing as, as far as I'm concerned. Like, he's, you know, he's not even he's not even clear to go back to practice, let alone getting cleared of actual concussion protocol. I don't think that's happening. Daniel Wise, you know, because of inclement weather. Uh, on Thursday, weren't able to see, you know, how much work he was getting on side field and all that stuff. They started indoors, moved outdoors uh, for the practice in the afternoon. But, you know, again, a high, hang, high ankle sprains are, are, are difficult things to come back from uh, super quick. James Smith, as you mentioned, Chris, like he, he's, he should be fine. I mean, he actually even kind of demonstrated what happened and what he did. So if you're demonstrating how you kind of overexerted a muscle muscle area or muscle group, you're, you're probably OK. Usually you're you're not going to do that. Um, but yeah, but I mean, the good news, you know, like I said, Jonathan Allen, Wes Schweizer, Trey Turner, Cole Holcomb, uh, Shaka Tony, also, you know, Cameron Curl, like uh, outside of, of some kind of a, of a weird setback, Cameron Curl should be on the field uh, for his for his first game of this regular season. Cole Turner, um, we're not really talking about him because he's not on the injury report, but the fact that he's not on the injury report is a very obviously positive sign that he's going to make his season debut, career debut, really. Um, and, and, you know, the Washington Commanders can use all the weapons they could possibly get. So some good news there. Uh, as far as that's concerned. And then for the Eagles, really, like you said, a, a lot of rest, right? They just came out of Monday night. So they, they didn't practice uh, Wednesday. They did a walkthrough, no physical exertion. And then today they gave a whole lot of guys rest days, um, which I think is is smart. You know, it's a long season. It's an even longer season now than it was before. So I think that's smart. That's a smart thing to do. But Avante Maddox is a guy who's not just getting rest days. He's actually got uh, a little bit of an injury. I don't think I would go as far as to predict Avante Maddox not playing. But when you're the Washington Commanders, right? Avante Maddox, 
potentially not playing because he's limited in practice. We'll see what happens on Friday. If he's not out there, that's a huge, huge impact in this game because that's going to open things up for whoever is in that slot as he is their uh, starting nickel. Well, guess who scored two touchdowns from the slot in his first two games in the NFL? Terry McLaurin. Uh, well, or he may Johan have. Well, he, he, <laughs> he, no, actually, Terry didn't. As many things as yeah. Terry has done, that's one thing he did not do. Yeah. Uh, although he could, but yeah. absolutely um, could, yeah, um, yeah. Jahan Dotson, you know, I mean, obviously, Jahan Dotson. Feel um, bad for whoever's but, replacing Avante if he can't go. I'll tell you that. Right, exactly. So, and 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 look, Avante Maddox is just part of a really good trio of corners, much better than the Commanders can throw out there. I can tell you that much. In Avante Maddox. James Bradbury, uh, and of course, Darius Slay, who is big play Slay uh, on Monday night. We'll see what happens uh, on Sunday. Uh, David, I'm, I'm curious, and, and and again, you mentioned the weather, and, and you guys were kind of procl- uh, precluded from uh, seeing. I, I take, you know, with Jonathan Allen being full go, I, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I assume he'll play. Like, they wa- did not want to play him 52 snaps last Sunday. They just, right. because of two hill, because of um, Daniel Wise going out so early, they, they almost didn't have a choice. I would expect Jonathan Allen to be – probably in the mid 40s, maybe even lower than that. And that probably would indicate, at least to me, that a guy like Jonathan Ridgway, who, you know, Mm -hmm. we've been separate the last couple of shows, but I I don't think you talked about him, if I remember from uh, the Tuesday episode, but Ridgway, because I think that came after uh, on on Monday evening or whatever, Ridgway might play a a pretty significant amount of snaps in his first game. Remember last week, Donovan Jeter, who was just claimed early that week, played 18 snaps. What is significant? I don't know, but he might play 20 snaps. Uh, I mean, 18 snaps your first week with the team is pretty significant. Yeah. You know? and, and I remember yeah. talking to Donovan in the locker room uh, the week leading up to Detroit, and, and and he was kind of asked, you know, like, what what are you expecting the player? How much can you really know of the playbook uh, before you go out there, you know, in such short notice? And he said, look, he's like, what I don't know. He's like, that's why I look over to Duran or I look over to John and say, hey, what's going on in this play? And, you know, a moment of candor, right, from the young defensive lineman, but obviously fans – aren't going to be happy to hear that's kind of something that an NFL player might go out there and do. But look, you don't you don't have a choice, you know. And, and when you look at, again, you look at the damage. I mean, Daniel Wise, I think he's listed officially as a de- defensive end, but you mentioned that he's a, he's a hybrid guy. He's a defensive tackle in a lot of sets. Mm-hmm. And if he's gone, John is on a pitch pitch count. Duran can't just do everything on his own, you know what I mean? Big Phil's not coming back. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Ridgeway may have to get out there sooner than, than anybody would honestly like. And, you know, there's no way to expect this guy to know uh, the playbook in three practices, five days or so of, of actually getting to study it. So he, yeah, he's going to, you know, he's just got to look to his left and right and they're going to say, go that way. And you, know, you might f- also fill that see, gap. Yeah. You might also see as a game day activation that betting put uh, if I'm yeah. saying his name correctly, uh, another guy who's been with Tampa, the other team, yeah. of course, that you work around a cover, uh, for yep. the last couple of years, so he's been here at least a week and a half. Maybe he gets one of those game day elevations yep. uh, from the practice squad. We'll have to see. Well, and at minimum, you know, something that's interesting about him that you bring him up is that you remember he was with the Buccaneers last right. season, right? When they beat the Philadelphia Eagles in the wild card round. So he yep. had, and granted, AJ Brown, you know, wasn't there, but you're talking about Jalen Hurts mainly from a defensive line standpoint and the, the running backs, Miles Sanders kind of game. Well, they're all the same. So he's got some insight into what they were able to do successfully, how they were able to do it uh, to frustrate and beat Jalen Hurts. Now, again, Jalen is taking steps forward, but, you know, there, there is some experience there. And I think that's important to know. To know. Absolutely. Now, uh, we also heard, Chris, from the offensive and defense coordinators for your Washington Commanders, Jack Del Rio, Scott Turner, spoke to the media on Thursday. We're going to come up with some uh, some topics to, of discussion from their press conferences, and we're going to come up with our confidences and concerns entering this first NFC East divisional matchup for the Washington Commanders. Absolutely. But first, we tell you about our friends at Bright.co. Bright.co Jewelry Insurance. Imagine the perfect setting, David. You've done everything right, and you have the woman of your dreams, um, or the person of your dreams, I guess, to be um, more correct. The person of your dreams standing by, just waiting for you to pop the question family and yours hiding at a distance. You've done everything right. You've thought of everything except to get insurance for the ring that you're about to put around this special person's finger. And you haven't And then you fumble the ring out of the case and into the crack of the Navy pier, if you will, that you're on and you can't get the ring. You can't find it. You can't get to it. It sounds like you would feel if you were a commander after last Sunday in Detroit. 
Not good. But if you would have listened to us and gone to bright.co jewelry insurance, you could have been backed up 100% in a simple two minute drill from your cell phone. And bright.co isn't just about rings, they can insure that special watch or necklace, whatever you need, and do it quickly at bright.co forward slash locked on, or again, a quick phone call for just $5 a month. Bright.co forward slash locked on is the place you want to go to check out the bottom line and some fun videos on exactly what you shouldn't do, but you should get some protection from the guys at bright.co. Hey guys, this is Joel from North Carolina. I was listening to the podcast and David mentioned that a lot of people don't want to hear honest. Well, let's be honest. This team is a dumpster fire from the top to bottom. Now, I want to give Jason Wright and I want to give Ron Rivera credit. I think they've done what they can with what they've been given to make improvements. This team will continue to be a dumpster fire as long as Daniel Snyder is the owner of this team. When you think about the bad decisions before they got here, as well as the bad behavior that has been allowed to continue, and the NFL has not had any repercussions for this owner. Why should he change? There it is. There's honesty. Y'all take care. Bye. All right. Once again, we thank you for making the Locked On Commanders podcast your first listen and your first view of the day. We've got some bold predictions coming up shortly. All right. Thank you very much, Joel. We appreciate the uh, insight. And, and yeah, David, I mean, that's pretty candid, pretty honest. Um, I mean, yeah. Listen, I, um, I actually don't remember he's saying that people don't like hearing honesty, but I mean, a lot of times that's true. So if I said it, I mean, it's it's pretty accurate. So I appreciate honesty, Joel. I absolutely appreciate you guys calling in with your 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 respectful opinion, right? When you get disrespectful, that's it's not the honesty I don't appreciate. It's the disrespect because we're not disrespectful to any of you guys. Uh, at least we try not to be. Um, is the team a dumpster fire? I'll just say this real quick, Chris. The team is not a dumpster fire. The defense right now definitely looks like a, a dumpster that could be on fire. Um, we'll see if it's fully engulfed after this weekend. But the team is actually running really well. And I can tell you, I'm not going to you know, put people's names on blast or anything, but there is a uh, female employee specifically that is pretty new to the team who absolutely loves her work environment and everything that she does on a daily basis. So they take that for, for what it's worth. Uh, we're going to um, share our confidence and concern points here in a sec, but you were with Jack Del Rio and Scott Turner. I think you were at both of those press conferences. Uh, yeah. I listened to them. The only thing of note that I took, I don't know about you, from JDR was he seemed very hesitant to do what he did last week, which was single-handedly call out Jamin Davis. You know, you're going to be asked about players, especially you know when, when people when coaches are talking about players being out of position, not mm -hmm. you know not following their assignments correctly, and all those things. You're going to get asked about players and. And Jack, you know, said, look, I'm, I'm not trying to stand up here every single week and evaluate our roster name by name, um, which I think is smart from a coach standpoint, too. You know, I don't know if anything was said, but it certainly is a shift in tone, which, you know, for, for one thing, I think is, is smart because, again, we talked about this earlier this weekend, last week. Like, if you're going to start calling guys out by name, that needs to kind of be the last straw. Like, once you call them out by name, if they don't get it right, the next step really is just to pull them off the field. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really all you're left with now. So it kind of puts you kind of paints you in a corner, but if you want to sit here and continue to coach this guy and continue to try to get the, the best product out of him, then don't call him out by name because that's just going to put the spotlight on him even brighter. Honestly, it's the best way to do it because mm -hmm. even if you get to the point where you'll pull him, obviously, if you pull a guy, you're going to get asked about him. But now that you've pulled him, you probably don't have any any issues with explaining why you pulled him. Uh, but let's move into now confidence and concerns. And of course, some of the concerns are that we're going to be engulfed in a dumpster fire of a defense at the end of week three, but we're not there yet. I think there's some smoke billowing. There might be a little bit of flames uh, licking the, the night air, but I don't think we're fully engulfed yet, Chris. My biggest confidence that this team can come out and kind of stave off the, the fires a little bit, uh, a little bit longer is a continued emphasis on the short, quick passes to set up the deeper stuff when available. Obviously, I'm talking about the offense, and sometimes a really good offense is the best defense because if your team is going out there scoring, not going three and out for the first five drives of the game, then your opponent also has to match or do better than what you're doing, which helps your defense, right? It helps simplify the opposing offense a little bit. So a good, a good defense is a good offense and, and you know, good offense, a good defense and all that stuff. It all goes hand in hand, complimentary football, yada, yada, yada. But what we need to see is that continued focus on getting the ball out quick, getting yards where you can, taking what the defense gives you type of thing. And what I saw early on in Detroit was an offense that was coming in trying to impose their will. And while I would love to see that kind of an attitude on defense, on offense, I want more of a take what they give you type of approach. And then, you know, when when they decide to, to shrink down and come up, uh, you counter punch them for the big play. Well, geez, that would have been great if they would have done that last week, which was my 
I think that was my biggest confidence that they would have a heavy run, natural screen game. And mm. instead there was just about anything but that. Uh, and, and, and certainly there were some check downs that looked right. like screens, but there wasn't the natural design that I was hoping for. So I hope, I hope your biggest confidence is exactly what we see one week late <clears throat> than it should have been quite honestly last week. Uh, my biggest confidence, David, and I'll go quickly here is that the commanders will probably start slow again and they could be down double digits in the first half before they wake up, smell the coffee and realize, oh yeah, the game started at one o'clock Eastern time. Now, why am I being so harsh? Well, let me give you this. 19 out of 35 regular season games, the Washington commanders in the Jack Del Rio, Ron Rivera era have allowed points of some sort on the first defensive drive of the game. Yeah. Um, in, in this year, it's, it's been points on, on, uh, on, on one of the two, uh, not on in Detroit, ironically enough, where they played worse, uh, but they almost allowed a touchdown to Jacksonville on the first drive settled ultimately for a field goal. Ultimately, it's always putting them behind, uh, behind the eight ball. I, I understand their offense came out quick against Jacksonville. It did anything but against Detroit. So again, an early start, a quick tempo is something that they need. They need a three and out. They need to get going early against Philadelphia to hopefully plant a little seed of down. And one other quick thing, uh, this my colleague Kevin Sheehan uh, from the Team 980 pointed out that uh, he counted 18 times in the Rivera del Rio era in which the Washington Commanders football team have been down by at least double digits in the first half. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a lot of deficits Pretty to try to come back from, especially when you're not working with a quote-unquote franchise caliber quarterback. So Chris's biggest confidence, a little bit of a concern by itself, but Chris, of course, we've got two more actual concerns uh, right. that we're going to bring up here when we start off segment three of today's episode. Absolutely. My, you're right. My confidence is a concern, but I don't, don't worry. I still have concerns, but betonline.net is not one of them because I'm on betonline.net all the time. I know David is, we're always bumping around. We're always getting those early line spreads that uh, uh, we get sent on Sunday night, sometimes even before the opponent plays like the Eagles on Monday night. And that's how you saw the Eagles go from minus four to minus six and a half. And you might see something similar to that again this week with the Cowboys playing on Monday night and Washington being the week for Sunday opponent. Either way, betonline.net is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Get all the league developments, game matchups, news, podcasts, and more uh, on everything NFL, college football, and even Major League Baseball. Live betting, esports, and scores are uh, the fastest way to check in on everything. And again, put some dollars down even while games are going on. Get in the action now. Go to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in the action at Bet Online, where the game starts. Todd, you tell. I look at this game a little different than maybe some of the other fans do. Uh, I look at it as a tale of two games almost. Yes, we sucked bad in the first half. It was bad. It sucked. There was nothing redeemable at all in the first half of this game. However, we come out in the sec or the third quarter. And halfway through the third quarter, you know, up until, I guess, kind of that interception, the Detroit had nothing. Our defense shut them down for the third and a little bit into the fourth, if I remember correctly. But we basically shut them down. Let's just call it a quarter. If we can find a way to summon more consistency, that third quarter play, there's, I would dare say we become dangerous for more than half the teams in the, in the NFL. We can score a lot more points than we used to that may save some games for us anyways that's my thoughts final segment here on the locked on commanders podcast final episode of the week before your washington commanders host the philadelphia eagles for week three shout out to todd in utah todd you'll never call too much i'll just put it put it that way to you uh, we always gotta agree with hearing from todd yeah i gotta i gotta agree with todd though nothing really that you want to take away from from the first half against detroit uh, and bring it with you back home to to face philadelphia and then about like you said, about halfway through the third quarter on, uh, things kind of started to pick up. But, you know, the, the question is, and I'll kind of leave this to the coaches who are much more uh, skilled in breaking down film and everything, is how much of that was the Washington Commanders figuring things out and how much of that was the Detroit Lions trying to salt away that game. That's 
that's kind of one of uh, the biggest questions you always have in those late game type of situations. We saw that with the Eagles and Vikings where the Eagles came out in the second half, really didn't do a whole lot as far as the scoreboard is concerned. Uh, but again, a lot of people are looking at that as the, as the Eagles just looking to get out of Monday night with the win in hand. And of course they did so, and they did so in thanks to a large part of, uh, our, of the efforts of quarterback Jalen Hurts. And that is my biggest concern for this game this weekend, Chris, is the Washington Commanders' ability to first contain Jalen Hurts. The Minnesota Vikings came out early in that Monday night game and tried to put pressure on Jalen. Very quickly realized that was a very bad idea and they were not going to do it successfully. So then what you look at them doing and they pointed it out kind of on the broadcast is their front four basically started just making the pocket, hold the pocket. Don't collapse it. Don't tear off a corner of it. Just stay be disciplined, try to get your hand on the ball, make Jalen beat you with his arms, which I th- or with his arm. And I think, honestly, when you look at Jalen Hurts, that's probably the best strategy is make him beat you by throwing the football. The problem for the Minnesota Vikings is he threw the football pretty well. There were some opportunities the Vikings could have had to come away, away with a takeaway or two, but they didn't take advantage of it. But still, by and large, for the most part, Jalen Hurts had a very, very good game as a thrower. So my concern here is, one, can you contain Jalen Hurts? Because we've heard about this team especially the defensive line playing out of assignment. And if you do that, you're going to lose contain. He's just going to gash you with his legs. If you do, can the secondary and the linebackers cover well enough to keep him from killing them with their arm with his arm? I mean, look, it's a pick your poison situation, but I have to say if I'm the Washington commanders and if I'm facing Jalen hurts, I want him to kill me with his arm, not his legs. I'm with you on that. Uh, I have a couple of different thoughts that uh, I'll hopefully be able to get to. But my biggest concern, David, is special teams costing them a win. I think this will be a close game. We'll get to our official predictions uh, coming up shortly. But mm-hmm. special teams, um, you know, <laughs> we we talked about this all off season and during the training camp preseason. I was scared to death. I, I think you were concerned. I don't know if I would describe you as scared to death about Joey Sly, about the kickoff returns, about right. the coverage, losing DeAndre Carter. All of it stunk last week from the extra point miss to the free punt kick return for 52 yards to um, the, the kickoff return again being a major, major, major problem. The entire operation stunk from A to Z, soup to nuts and everywhere in between and everything that I feared all off season and the training camp and the preseason came to roost last week. And I hope it doesn't cost them a win or at least a chance to win on Sunday against Philadelphia. All right. So our bold prediction, David, um, we're, we're going to do uh, this. I'll, I'll go first and, and I'll, I'll just kind of add to what you were saying. I think they'll be forced to play more man coverage in this game than they ideally have and wanted to uh, on the back end, right? Uh, they're usually about a 70%, and the numbers bear it out, according to PFF, about a 70% zone team, 30% man so far this year. They haven't been good in either coverage, let's be honest. But I think ultimately they are going to want to be more aggressive, more physical, more in your face, because I think that's the only way they're going to try and be able to slow down uh, Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown and maybe even Dallas Goddard with the addition of Cam Curl and others. Um, so to me, I think more aggression, that might lead to more blitzing, and it also might lead to more problems in terms of containing Jalen Hurts because usually when you're in man, your back is turned to the quarterback in a lot of cases, and that forces or that causes the quarterback to have more room to run before the defense realizes what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I think they think the interesting thing, kind of going back to your special teams conversation, like it's it's definitely not what you want, and you definitely want better. But I think it's interesting that Dax Milne actually is the fourth ranked kick returner in yards per kick yeah. uh, return for anybody that has four or more kick returns. There are some right. guys that have like one or two that are averaging better, but for anybody who's actually returned four or more kicks, Dax Milne actually has has like a top five NFL average. I think so. I don't know how much of that is the NFL game, and how much of that is is some of the new rules, and how much of that. Is Washington? It's interesting to learn. I want you know. It's kind of you know. It's, it's a question of is the special team, especially the return game, just being minimized by the NFL, or is this really a problem contained to Washington? Something to keep track of uh, very much as we go through the season. Uh, my bold prediction is that Cameron Curl, your safety for Washington Commanders, not only is he going to make his return, but he's going to have a stat box hat trick. I'm kind of making this up on my own. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not talking tackles. I'm not talking PBUs because, honestly, it's kind of what you get paid for. That's kind of the bare minimum, right? So I'm talking tackles for loss, sacks, interceptions, forced fumbles, fumble, fumble recoveries, things that can shift the tide of the game. 
I think Cam Curl Chris is going to get at least one of three different categories. So he's getting at least one tackle for loss, sack, INT, forced fumble, fumble return. Three of those five categories, he's putting a one or more in each of those category boxes on Sunday. I like that. I like that. I hope Cam Curl is everything that we uh, have become used to over his first two years. He's not Superman, but he is a versatile uh, switchblade. My key player on Sunday is going to be the returning, we think, unless something happens over the weekend here, yeah. Wes Schweitzer at center for Chase Roulier. I mean, remember, not only Chase on IR and probably lost for the season, but Schweitzer didn't practice all last week and didn't play in the game in Detroit. He has played at center. He is expected to be the starting center um, with uh, with uh, Mr. Martin kind of probably backing him up, but just getting here a couple of days ago. Wes Schweitzer versus an uh, aggressive attack by Jonathan Gagnon at times, uh, the defensive coordinator of the Philadelphia Eagles. He doesn't always like to blitz, as mm -hmm. was pointed out uh, by Louis DiBiase on the crossover Thursday edition, but he sure did against a susceptible offensive line Monday night in uh, the second half, especially uh, against Minnesota. So to me, I think he'll be aggressive in this game. Wes Schweitzer and making all the adjustments, making all the blocking uh, assignments and all that, and protecting up the middle against hard grave against Fletcher Cox will be uh, the key player for me. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's really good. Well, my key player is Jamin Davis. For better or worse, I think he's going to play a major role in whether or not Washington gets a win this Sunday. Look, PFF, his overall grade for the season, 47 and a half. That's not very good. His run defense grade, 74.7, which is actually pretty good. Pass, ru pass rush grade, 75.1, which is actually pretty good. His coverage grade is a 29.3. Yeah. And uh, we've seen that in the first two weeks. Um, you know, shout out to you, Chris. You know, I was talking to a couple of people on the sidelines today during practice or on Thursday during practice. And I actually almost kind of wonder if maybe the idea holds, holds some water. Maybe we'll see it. Maybe Jamin Davis really doesn't even go into pass coverage except for maybe a pseudo pass coverage while he's spying Jalen Hurts and do a little bit uh, of what I'm told the the Seattle, I don't know, the Houston Texans did against the Denver Broncos, I think, last weekend where they kind of uh, rushed. They rushed and, and kind of slanted their pass rush, right, to force mm -hmm. Russell Wilson to the side they wanted. And then if you have a linebacker spying him, you kind of know my defensive line is going to push him to this side of the field. So now as a linebacker who's not as athletic as this quarterback, I don't have to spy him for 50 yards, sideline to sideline. I have to spy him for about 25 to 20 yards because my defensive line is going to cut that pocket in half for me. It's an interesting tactic. I, I can't remember who played the Denver Broncos last week, so I apologize for that. But no, it was whoever Houston, it was, it was the Houston Texans. Yeah, that's right. that's apparently kind of the angle they took. And look, I mean, up until the fourth quarter collapse, it worked pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, Houston's been feisty, no doubt about it. That's yeah. a good. I, I didn't even think about that angle, but you're right. Cutting down half the field might at least sort of box Jalen Hurts in and allow Jamin to use his athleticism. We know, as you pointed out, we've seen it with our own eyes. He can get after the quarterback. Yep. He had the sack on Sunday. He almost had another one on the DeAndre Swift, the uh, you know, little loft touchdown. Uh, mm -hmm. And he had one taken away in week one against Jacksonville. Something to keep yep. uh, in mind. David, um, I'm going to go for a final prediction uh, just because we're uh, way late on time here. Uh, I made this sort of unofficially on the crossover Thursday edition that I did with Louis DiBiase of Locked on Eagles, which everybody can go still check out uh, wherever you get this podcast. Uh, but I'm going to go 24-21 birds, Washington plus the six or the six and a half, depending on what you get it. So I think it'll be a close game. I think Washington covers, but comes up just short. Yeah, uh, You know, last week, Chris, you picked, you picked Washington to lose and you, and you caught a lot of flack for it. You know what I mean? Something that we need to clarify to everybody. We don't work for the Washington Commanders. We don't work for the National Football League. We are we are paid to tell you what we see, what we believe, and we're paid to tell you the truth. Shout out to Joel. You may not always like it, but uh, you're always going to get the truth out of us. So, Chris, two weeks in a row picking Washington to lose, and uh, it's going to be one week in a row for me picking Washington <laughs> to lose. I've got the Eagles winning this one, 31 to 27. Look, the deficiencies that we've seen with this Washington Commanders team they just match up too perfectly with the strengths that the Philadelphia Eagles have. I, I don't know how else to put it. You know what I mean? It's, it just kind of is what it is. I do think that this commander's offense will find a way to get going earlier than they did against Detroit, make the game closer, cover the spread. So if you're a spread better, both of us think that the, the, the Washington's going to cover the spread. Louis DiBiase had blocked on Eagles thinks that Washington's going to cover the spread. But if you're a money line person, we do all think that the Eagles are going to win. Would love a Victory Monday episode. Would love to come to you live from FedEx and eat 
our our or eat some crow. Um, we're not actually going to eat crow, but would love to have a live episode from FedEx Sunday evening, Chris, where we're we're apologizing to all Commanders fans for ever doubting this team. But as of right now, the way that we see it, with the way we read these tea leaves, probably looking at an Eagles win on Sunday. How about a cookie, huh? We will eat a cookie. There you go. We'll I don't know if that's going to satisfy any angry fans, but we will and do a, it anyway. And a bad hot dog as, as well. <laughs> uh, all right. That is going to do it for this edition. Thanks to Joel and Todd uh, for their contributions on the voicemail line. Of course, you can always hit up the voicemail 301-615-3577, 301-615-3577. We thank you again for making us your first listen and view of the day. Now make the second listen and view the Peacock and Williamson NFL show. Brian Peacock, former NFL scout, Matt Williamson, giving you the expert NFL analysis in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Podcast. Again, as David mentioned, we'll be live from FedEx Field late Sunday afternoon, early evening. The exact time to be determined. We'll advise on social media and post on how you can join us live from FedEx Field. For my partner, David Harrison, covering the Washington Commanders for Commanders Country on SI.com's Fan Nation. I'm Chris Russell, one half of the Russell and Ned Hershel on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app. Uh, if you're out and about, please be safe. Be kind to one another. Don't you dare drive like a maniac. And thank you for joining us right here on the Locked On Commanders Podcast.